Okay, got that. And we'll pop this guy up. And I'll share a screen. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Oops. Anyone? <laughs> okay, thanks, Colin. Okay. Come on, why are you not doing? There we go. Okay, welcome to the December 2023 meeting for the Seattle Robotics Society. Um, I'm hosting today. Steve is still off doing something else. Uh, video is provided by Zoom. We are recording this meeting, and we will repost. We'll post it to YouTube a little bit later. Uh, it'll either be today or maybe Tuesday or so when we get this guy posted for folks uh, if they miss it. And we're going to kind of just do our typical uh, typical agenda for the day. So please mute your microphone unless you're uh, actively sharing. Uh, the Zoom, use the Zoom chat to ask any questions, comments, and so forth. The chat will also be captured and posted. So if you put something in there, that'll go along with the meeting for the future. Um, I think we already know this. I'm hosting for a while. Uh, Steve will be back. I think he's probably got about three-ish months or so left on the thing he's got conflict with on this, but he'll be back fairly soon. Um, yep, September, we just talked about that. Last events. Okay, local maker spaces. We talked about this one last month. This is pretty much the same slide. We got Snowco and Everett, ACLS and Fedway. Korea Makerspace in Renton, Seattle Makers in Seattle, uh, Altspace Seattle in uh, Seattle, Airlight Time Space, okay, and North End Makers. Uh, if you've got another makerspace in your area, please let Steve know and he can add it to the slide. Events coming up. Uh, this is out of date, so let's just skip that. <laughs> okay, Robothon Committee. Um, that slide's a little munged as well. We are continuing to meet. Um, see, we're going to do two events this year. Uh, one, we're looking at the May June timeframe, and essentially that will be held down at the new First Law Fieldhouse. So that'll be an indoor event primarily. Um, we haven't decided on contest yet, but you can start thinking about you know line maze, line following, walker, sumo, those types of contests. And then we're going to do probably late September, we will do the Robothon Plus event like we did this year at the Sunnycrest Elementary School. So we'll get those posted on the website here fairly soon. But if you're looking at building a, you know, building a robot, that's kind of what the direction to start heading. So start thinking about those events and we'll get you more information as soon as we can. Um, if anybody would like to help out, Please let us know. We're always looking for volunteers, as usual. <laughs> uh, Donna, Bob, did, did either of you want to say anything more on the Robothon side? You folks are here this time? No, nothing to add at this time. Okay. Uh, ditto, ditto for me. Okay. And we do will we move any, forward. Um, oh. Do we have any fundraising plans for the, the events uh, out of curiosity, you know, like T-shirts or anything of that nature? Yeah, actually, with T-shirts, so we have talked about T-shirts. We, we're probably not going to do um, the printed T-shirts like we've done in the past, just simply because that takes a fair amount of, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good capital expense up front, and then if you don't sell them. But what we do have is we still have a supply of, remember the, pol the SRS polo shirts that... Uh, so we're going to do something with those. We're going to get those moving. And if while we're on the topic of that, if folks want a um, a Bebot kit, we still have four of those as well. So get a hold of me, and I can get you a Bebot kit if anybody wants one of the robot kits. We probably, once we sell out of these kits, we'll probably not order another group of, grouping of them. So we ordered six of them like before COVID, and I've still got like four of them. <laughs> 
So <clears throat> unless, you know, if interest really picks up, we'll do something with it. But uh, that, that seems to be a bit of a fading trend and we'll figure something else out to do going forward. Yep. Thought I heard somebody about to say something. Okay. And of course, my next baking opportunity. Um, if you'd like to do a presentation, please let Steve know. <laughs> we are always looking for presenters. And um, I'll tell you, for running these, finding presenters is about the biggest chunk of work. So if you know of anyone or can do a presentation, uh, please let Steve know down at Seattle Robotics Society at gmail.com. And here's the, oh, if we don't have a presenter, uh, we'll do some of these open discussion forums. So we've always got the possibility of doing one of those. If you'd like to host one, let Steve know. Here's the schedule so far. Um, today we have Bob Cook. He's going to present on his Robo Magellan robot. We do have a speaker for January and February. And March is the next open slot. So. Uh, you're looking if you're looking to present march is all yours just contact steve speaking of bob here's our presentation for today <laughs> uh let's see post meeting yes um if somebody wants to if anyone wants to hang around after the meeting uh we'll stop the recording i'm gonna have to depart as usual but uh, I'll pass the, the meeting host off to whoever would like to hang around and just close the meeting down after. You're welcome to hang out all day if you want and chat. Okay, around the room. Um, who has something they'd like to share? We're zipping right along here. We might start Bob's presentation early. I've got something if there's if nothing else. Um, does anyone have anything? like? I kind of like to go last because mine actually, when I discovered um, playing with it, actually dovetails straight into Bob's talk fairly nicely. So if anybody else would like to go first, go for it. No takers. Okay. So I'm just going to dive in with mine. <clears throat> Let's see here. Okay, can everybody see my web browser? Okay, let me make this a little smaller here. Yep. That's the stopwatch. Okay, so what I was going to share is essentially a lot of, essentially there's a couple of utilities out there and these are what's called, um, I'm not sure the formal name for them. I call them live documents as opposed to living documents. And the first one I want to show is Colab. So this is Google Colab, and I will put the, put the link to it in the meeting notes. Oops. Uh, I have to stop sharing. I'll add it in a little bit. It's a bit small. <clears throat> it's a bit so small. I can't read anything. Yeah. Ah. OK, let me switch. let me switch to a different screen. I've actually got you on a got this on a very large screen. This will also give me a moment to put this in the chat. Okay. Whoop. Okay. Let me try on this screen. Hey, wrong screen. <laughs> well, that's annoying. All right, we're going to do it a different way. I tell it the right screen and it shares the wrong screen. So I'm just going to share a window. Okay, can folks see that better? Okay. I'm going to actually size it just a little bit to 
Is it better on my screen? Okay, so what this is Google Colab. And what this fundamentally is, is a Jupyter notebook. So if you've not messed with Jupyter before, it's a web-based um, web editor. And it allows you to put both code and markup text in a document. And so I'm just going to open up my little demo here for SRS. OK. <clears throat> So in, in Colab, this, this is essentially a Jupyter Notebook. The uh, IPYNB extension tends to go with Jupyter Notebooks. I don't know where that came from. And I'm, I'm still fairly new to this. This is something I'm starting to play with. Um, but here's the, so basically what you do is you add these little blocks. So like, this is some text. If I go in there, you know, I could just edit the text. Okay. And down here, I can type in some code. So the code, um, by default, this takes Python code. You can actually put what's called a kernel into it. And you can do just about any, any language I've seen kernels for. Uh, Python and R are the most common ones. Let's see if I can see. Yeah, I'll do that in a minute. And what you do, this is the part that makes this interesting. <clears throat> so, you know, text, you can do all the formatting and so forth. And yeah, so it's a text editor. That's not all that interesting. <laughs> what is interesting are these code blocks. And then you go up here and you say connect. And when you say connect, this is actually going to connect to a remote session in Colab. And you can select your runtime type. So this is the really interesting thing with Colab. <clears throat> right now, there is a CPU, and that's just you know normal. You can get a T4 GPU or a TPU for free. So if you want to play with some machine learning or training some neural nets so for, and something like that for free, you can go into Colab and um, Basically, you know, there's a there's a GPU. If you want to pay, and I think it's about nine to twenty dollars a month uh, U.S., you can get an A100 or a V100 uh, GPU. These are actually full-on um, professional-grade GPUs. An A100 is uh, one of the more powerful ones. So you can pay for that. And this, you know, is something you're you're probably not going to buy an A100 GPU for home. Okay, um, and then what you can do is come up here and say, run this cell. And so this starts a Python instance in the background. And you notice it took a little while, let it print it out 10. So I can put any code there. And I'll show a little bit more of that in a little, in a little bit. Um, the other thing with the with the Jupyter Notebooks is they're becoming a pretty standard way to share training, uh, training materials and so forth. So in here, I just put a link to a training model. Uh, you see it's Colab Research. So Colab has a ton of these training models online. And if you look through, this is TensorFlow. So I'm gonna jump over here. And here's what a really full on uh, Jupyter Notebook looks like for TensorFlow. So this is TensorFlow 2 Quick Start. Um, you can you know, run it in Colab. You can view the GitHub. You can download the notebook. So even though this is in the cloud, you can pull it down for yourself. Um, introduction to Keras, which is uh, um, still getting into this, but it's a top level thing that sits on top of TensorFlow. And you can see in here, they've got you know, code snippets interlaced with instructions. <clears throat> and I'm not going to go ahead and run all this. Um, but anyway, that's Colab. The other one I want to show, I'll stop sharing. And as folks might be, um, you know, thinking, you know, hey, this is great. I'm running in the cloud. But if I'm going to do this for work, I've just uploaded my work material to the cloud. And there's security issues around that. 
<clears throat> so this is actually, as I mentioned, this is actually built on top of Jupyter Notebook. And let me just stop sharing here for a second. And let me bring up the next one. Jupyter Notebook can be run locally. Where did I put my script? I won't go through all the um, all the intricacies to start this or to install it. Basically, it's all online. Um, I can put a link in in a moment. Let me share another share this window. And let's see. Flag. Okay, so this is Jupyter. Uh, this is actually Jupyter Lab, which also builds on top of Jupyter Notebook. And you can see I've done the same thing here. Now, this particular one is all running locally on my computer. So um, in the background, I started up a little server, and then the, this browser is connecting to that server. And you can see the same thing. I've got um, the interface is a little different. But I've got the same basic thing. I've got, you know, A equals 10. I can run that. And you notice it's a lot faster. <laughs> um, there's some markdown. This is raw. Um, this is just a little blob of code that I grabbed off of a uh, one of the AIs. I told it, hey, print me a graph, you know, create a piece of Python code to print a, um, or to generate a gravity field, you know, mathematical gravity field. So if I come in and run this, it took a second. But here's the other neat piece. This is MATLAB plot, which is a Python um, library. So in the Python, you can say I'm importing MATLAB plot. I define some stuff. And then I actually do a plot, a quiver plot, and then show it. And Jupyter Notebook will grab that plot and show it. So if I'm working with you know, some live data. Um, you know, I could just actually go in and on the fly edit it. I can play with my data. I can plot it. I can connect this to databases and I can print out data. I can do whatever I want in a very iter iterative fashion. So the data scientist groups or data scientist types use this pretty intensively from what I found. But I'm starting to use it as just kind of a general live engineering notebook for myself. And I've got one more thing I want to show, which is go over here. And this is the dovetail into. Uh, let's see. Right. So part of what um, Bob is going to be talking about is YOLO. So I don't want to steal Bob's thunder. So I'm going to I'm going to show this link, and then I'm going to stop, and we'll see if anybody else wants to talk. And if not, we'll take a break, and then we'll go talk to let Bob take over. So not to steal Bob's uh, thunder here, but as a um. As an intro, you'll see these, um, a lot of these uh, machine learning sites and so forth now have this open in collab button on there. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. And now you'll see what this has done. This has taken me back to um, collab with another one of these tutorial pages. And here's all the instructions for setting up and installing YOLO 8. So if people want to play with this and you don't, I mean, you can do this on an, like an iPad at this point, right? Because this is all hosted in the cloud. So you don't need a computer. You don't need a GPU. You don't need it. Well, you need a computer of some type, sorry. <laughs> you don't need a robust computer. <laughs> um, you don't need a fancy GPU. This is a really inexpensive and easy to use way to play with this stuff. And I started getting into this a little bit for work stuff. And as I mentioned, I'm starting to use it for some of my own um, 
you know, engineering notebooks and such because just because of the interactivity. Um, and then uh, Bob was coming along with his presentation. It's like, hey, wait a minute, this, there's a connection here. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And would anybody else like to um, do it around the room? Let's see. Let me close these down. I think one of these things is what was creating my problem with my computer. So something with Firefox, if you just leave it running in here, it was doing weird and obnoxious things, which I didn't like. So we'll stop doing that. Uh, let's see. Okay. So with the... interesting. Um, with that, what Bob, do you how do you feel about starting in about 15 minutes? Are you good with that? Oh. I can start whenever you're ready. Okay, so why don't we take about a 15 minute break just so we get our break in. Um, so just a quick double check. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to show for around the room? We're kind of light on these lately, so. <laughs> and I didn't have any videos popped up this time, so I was hoping somebody would show something. But... We all need to get off our butts and start making progress on our robotics projects. I know. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a couple of events coming up in 2024. So, you know, we, we want robots for those. So, I believe the Snooko Makerspace was intending to do something in February for um, Robo uh, Pop Can Challenge, I think. Oh, OK. As well. I, I don't I didn't see that on your calendar of stuff, but I'm pretty sure that's scheduled and everything. OK, uh, we'll try to catch up with Chaz on that. And by yeah, the way, and... oh, go ahead, Donna. Oh, I was going to say it's. I think it's February twenty fourth. It's mm -hmm. over on their, on their group or club, or makerspace we uh, web website, and it's definitely on their on their meetup uh, mm -hmm. that is advertised in there. So yeah, they've got an actual event uh, scheduled in there on their meetup uh, page. So for all the inf info on that, but yes, it is official and it's uh, going cool. to be in. Um, Either fact of anyway in the Factoria slash Bellevue uh, region, I believe. Okay, we'll have to try to get that to uh, Steve so he can update the slides. And oh, the other piece I was going to say coming on that is one of the um, competitions we're considering for the May June event is a um, pop can challenge uh, for that one as well. So you got a pop can robot that'll be another another shot. Okay. I did see cool. something that was uh, kind of non-robotic that electronics people might be interested. Yeah, go for it. It's um, okay. So there's a thing called a cross point switch, which is basically just like a, a a a bunch of relays, but they're solid state. And the idea is that you can connect electrically connect any two uh, pins together, any two wires together. It's about a 70 ohm connection, but you can double them up and get it down to a 35. Um, anyway, so there's these chips called cross point switches. And this guy who won the Hackaday Supercon this year, um, he built a cross point switch into a whiteboard. So like, you know, a little breadboarding uh, whiteboard, right? You know what mm -hmm. I'm talking about. Yeah. Push the chips mm -hmm. into it, all that kind of stuff. So... The point then is that without putting what in a jump, there you go. Right, exactly. So now, instead <laughs> of having to cut a little piece of wire and strip it and, and shove that little jumper wire between two of those bus bars, you can programmatically connect any two pins together, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's cool, right? You can, you can save those files and load them up instantly. And, you know, you can do like i need an array of these connected to that and do it like really fast that's cool but what's the next level bit is he put a row of programmable leds under every one of the buses on the little whiteboard right so now he has uh, the processor that's on the board can be programmed or can be set up to show the voltage on every one of the little things from like oh, interesting. 
blue to red so you can like see at a glance what your circuit is doing on every pin right or you can change the programming it'll show you the current that's going through that particular pin or if you'd like you can program it to show you the frequency that's going through that particular pin so your your whole like thing is completely like visual to you then yeah. and you can go oh wait why is the voltage blue on that pin <laughs> uh it should have been red right uh oh i see this chip is not putting out the signal that it's supposed to put out you know or whatever right so that's cool I just yeah. thought it was kind of interesting. If you if you want to check it out, it's uh, uh, on Hack a Day, and it's called Jumperless, because you can. Let me just see. Let me just see if he's got a video of that real quick. Hang on. That's pretty cool. That sounds a lot like the um, the way that the Cypress PSOC and PROC um, microcontrollers yep. work. Um, exactly. Exactly. Here's the yeah. here's the link to the project. I'll put it in the chat called and if anybody jump. hasn't used those those are um very inexpensive ways to jump into um system on a chip um projects and programming their they've made their their programming interface really seamless where you actually um don't do programming anymore directly you just wire it up and it does the programming right. background but it used to be you could get behind that and do direct programming if you wanted to as well. I'm not sure if that's still available. It should be, but I, I haven't yeah. played with it in a while. Yeah. Um, what but, I love about yeah. the PSOC the stuff is the, the what I love about the PSOC stuff is that for like 10 bucks, you can get yeah. a JTAG, you know, you plug it in, it's got the whole like step debug everything, plus the ability to build up the circuits, plus a little bit of digital logic, which is handy for yeah. um doing like high speed signal processing and that kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, t tell you what, on this jumperless thing, he's got a video on there that's about four minutes long. We've got a little time. Folks interested in taking a couple of minutes and watching the video? Yeah. Okay, hang on. Well, Maybe. I am. <laughs> I won't vote for everyone. Okay, I've got a Just day. Me. Do I have any days? <laughs> I, I think it's worth seeing. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. And did I mention that he won the... Supercon prize. Oh no! Class. Yeah, yeah. He he's the Supercon winner. Uh, set. Well, I'm sorry. Second place. Second place. First place was a Braille uh, interface device. Okay. Can folks see that? Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. I should I should tell you too that Kevin is a a, a frustrated artist. He got mm -hmm. into programming because he couldn't make a living as an artist, and so ah. you see, like like he he everything he does is artistic. Smart move. <laughs> if you've ever played around with electronics, you're probably familiar with these useful little guys. If you've made anything interesting on a breadboard, you're probably familiar with this too. Now your circuit isn't working and you need to dig through this jumper jungle to find out where you stuck something one row off. Jumper jungle. Let's ditch I this like mess it. and go jumperless. Using a bunch of 8x16 analog crosspoint switches wired together into one bigger switch, Jumperless makes real, fully analog hardware connections between any points on the breadboard or the Arduino Nano header at the top, instead of needing to use jumper wires. Now you can throw circuits together in seconds. Just throw down some parts and wire them up in Wacqui, or any other software you prefer. The jumpers will be updated in real time from your project. Jumperless also has voltage and current sensing, so the RGBs under each row can show you a ton of information about what's going on with your circuit. It has two DACs, four ADCs, two current sensors, and five GPIO that can be routed anywhere on the board or the nano header. Need some power? Jumperless has you covered. The breadboard's power rails are selectable between 3.3, 5, and plus minus 8 volts with a slide switch. It's not faking it either. These are your actual signals moving around through CH446Q analog crosspoint switches. Each connection can pass plus minus 9 volts at 50 megahertz and are tested up to 100 milliamps. At its core, Jumperless is really just a huge 100 by 100 analog crosspoint switch that's easy to interface with. It can be used for anything you like. The breadboard and nano header is just a convenient way to plug stuff in, but it doesn't need to be there. It's meant to allow other makers to incorporate as much of the routing matrix and logic as they need into their own PCBs and just worry about the rest of their project. This thing is open source AF and was designed with the intent to make as few assumptions about how it's used as possible, while still keeping it very easy to use for beginners. It's controlled by an RP2040 and shows up just like a Raspberry Pi Pico. 
so it's super easy to load your own firmware on it to extend its functionality. You can use the existing firmware like a library. Or, if you're more of a scripting language person, you can just send it lists of connections over serial and Jumperless will make it happen. It's super easy to command with quick and dirty scripts, and the don't connect power directly to ground kind of protections are done on the board itself, so you can play around fearlessly. You can even type in connections by hand if you want. Jumperless can make or break connections in under 30 microseconds, and do it programmatically, while being able to measure voltage, current, and resistance very quickly, so measurements can trigger a change in the connections. Want to tune a 555 for an exact frequency? Just put in a bunch of different valued capacitors and have the Jumperless switch them in and out until it's spot on. If you want to see what's going on somewhere in your circuit, you can connect any of the four analog to digital converters or the two current sensors to any row and have the hue and brightness change with the voltage or current. It can pass high speed signals without issue. So yeah, of course you can play Doom on it. <laughs> <laughs> See those two rows of headers at the top? That's for an Arduino Nano, or one of the hundreds of development boards available in that footprint. Now, I know people will get caught up on the form factor here. If you compare this to a regular $3 breadboard, then yes, it's a complex solution to a somewhat minor problem. Dealing with rat's nest breadboards is held sacred by electronics engineers. Here's a short list of some awesome new things you could do with a jumperless. I'd love to hear your ideas, especially the completely unhinged ones. <laughs> Use it to probe pins on an unknown IC, or guide you through converting a schematic to a real circuit. Simulate parts you don't have or don't exist alongside real components. Make it into a universal EEPROM reader. Run genetic algorithms on hardware to find weird AI-generated circuits. Send virtual jumpers over the internet to another jumperless. Automate patch cables in a modular synth setup. Or do whatever crazy cool thing you can come up with. Very cool. Yeah. That's awesome. I have to say, too, Kevin is just, like, literally the coolest guy. He's really smart and really nice. I'm, I'm totally impressed with him. <clears throat> Okay. Anything else for show and tell? All right. With that, I will go ahead and let's do a 15 minute timer. And we'll share the screen. And I'll keep the. Um, Keep the tape rolling so if people want to talk and stuff during the break we can do that and there we go we'll be back in 15 minutes at which point we'll get bob started
Hey, I have a question while we're waiting, if that's allowed. Okay, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, is there like any kind of a forum or I don't know, like place where people in the SRS can chat in between meetings? I I don't know if we still have the Monday night. There used to be a Monday night, um, almost like an IRC, um, that was worldwide. Um, uh, we should ask Lloyd when he comes back because I I just don't remember if that's being managed anymore. Um, but that that would be my thought. Um, or if anything has replaced it. Um, it's been a long time since I. Uh, uh, tried to to do it. Uh, it ended up being for me that my schedule was just too frenetic to hit the six to eight time frame on a Monday night uh, for it. Um, I was hoping there'd be something more like temporally insensitive. Did you like that? I any chance <laughs> I get to use the word temporal? I just we had a we had a problem with signals coming back from the robot with a slight time displacement and of course i was like wait time displacement do you mean a temporal displacement are you <laughs> saying it was a temporal offset in the data <laughs> doesn't that just like validate your life i've wanted my whole life to use that word but i meant like, like something like a discord server or a forum or irc or something like that where you can like post it's a message a, it's a yeah, good question i'm uh, digging on the srs site uh go ahead Whoever was going to add to that. I was just going to, uh, this is Bob, I was just going to comment the, um, it's not SRS specific. There is a, uh, a personal robotics discord uh, that there's a lot of people around the world who are on. Um, oh, cool. What What's the, what's the name of it? Uh, mm, I think I keep thinking it's personal robotics. I'll go, I'll go away here and find, find it for just a second. Or maybe Adam's on here and he would have the link. Send me uh, an invite. I'm James Newton on. Well, I, I guess that doesn't work unless we share a thing or our friends. But I, I, I've seen a lot of really good um, Discord channels that I've really enjoyed. So finding one for robotics would be excellent. Yeah, I'm searching the list of Discord servers for personal robotics and I don't see anything. And even if I search for just like robotics, all of the ones that I've been able to find on there are, are like specific to a, an individual robot, like they're run by the company that makes uh, the robot. I put a link. I, maybe that's an invite link that maybe works. I put it into the chat. Give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Hey, cool. Yes. Thank you. Hey, you bet. Yeah, there's quite a few people around the world on there with lots of different topics and super friendly people just drop in whatever text, comments, questions, uh, and, and you'll get a, you'll get some feedback. Awesome. My other favorite one is uh, Hackaday has a great um, Discord channel. They, they also have like a forum that's a part of their website. But to be totally honest with you, the forum just absolutely sucks. Horrible. <laughs> really bad. Oh, no. It says here I have to treat people with respect if I join this Discord server. All it's right. a small price to pay. It's quite okay. I suppose I'll have to 
I'll have to accept that. This looks really good. Nice. Okay, I just dropped the Jupiter Lab uh, link setup link in there, and there was one other I was going to drop. <clears throat> I think it was the YOLO one. Again, not to steal Bob's thunder. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> okay, there's the links. I, <clears throat> there's the links I promised. If anybody gets into the tiny ML stuff, I also ended up, I didn't show it, but I also picked up a um, Arduino Nano BLE Sense. And it's, that it was on that little board I showed. That's a really cool little Arduino board. It's got a processor on it and um, a ton of sensors. Magnetometer, IMU, uh, gyro. So it's got essentially a nine-doff. Uh, IMU or nine off uh, motion sensor on it. Two microphones, um, a gesture sensor, a temperature sensor, and a humidity sensor. I think it's like forty bucks. <laughs> hey, I just wow. realized this is the perfect group to ask a question of: Is there, mm -hmm. is there a embedded development system? You know, something like a uh, ESP, but it doesn't necessarily have to have Wi-Fi. The, the thing I'm looking for is one that can be programmed by just dropping a file into a folder. You know how you can you can yeah. enumerate as a uh, as a flash drive Look when you plug the, in your yeah. If I remember, double check me because I'm it's going off the top of my head. Look at the STM32 development boards. I'm pretty sure okay. they work that way. Awesome. Awesome. Getting ready to teach a new class, and I really want to find something that kids who are using um, uh, Chromebooks, they, they can't. Oh, well, yeah. They, they can save things, but then it just resets the next time around. So the students all bring along their own, like, flash drives or whatever mm -hmm. so it allows that but some of them i've i've been told i don't really know have problems with serial interfaces and they can't install any software so like how are you supposed to program a microcontroller steve, steve would be the one to ask for that and i do know in particular the arduino ide has right. a web-based ide that can program over the usb I've seen yeah. that recently too. So that that might be another option. Well, yeah, that that was what I went for uh, the first time around, and I haven't really been able to confirm this one way or the other. I, I'm probably going to have to go out and buy a Chromebook or something. But um, I've been told that for whatever reason, the Chromebook won't allow them to uh, write out to the serial ports. Mm -hmm. Like if you plug in something that enumerates as a serial port, and then you try to write to it, even though you can do that from Chrome now. Um, right directly to a serial port that for whatever reason on the Chromebooks at the school, they, they, they can't do that. Re reach out to Steve. I'll do that. Thanks. Because he, he's very familiar with Chromebooks and he also does some of these little robotic uh, classes. Okay. And he, okay. He, he may have he very likely, I would say has already solved this problem somehow because he's, he's in, he, he's lives in that space. I'm Those are the best kind of I'm problem that with somebody some, else has solved. I'm working with some teens using the same kind of robot that Steve um, showed us a while ago that he's teaching with. Um, and it's a make block robot um, that 
has a Bluetooth interface off your phone, but it also does web programming as well as local programming. But the local programming would require you to download the programming um, environment, which you can do. But on a Chromebook, you you could use the web-based interface to do programming, and it saves a, the program files to the web. It doesn't doesn't leave them local, um, and it uses uh, Blockly Prop uh, or something similar. And uh, but you can also get behind the scenes and go directly into the code um, as well for the older students. And that's nice. uh, an Mbot Ranger is the robot that I have. Uh, that's the one that Steve uses a lot. It's very modular. It's really nice. It's, it's kind of bulletproof for uh, uh, in its modularity, so it's very easy to add stuff. It uses um, cables, or it has a nice microcontroller. It has a bunch of features and sensors in it, and it ports out to the sensors using little phone plug cables instead of you know loose wires. Oh, um, yeah. I remember Steve actually did a whole thing about this. The only yes. trick is it's like way beyond my price range oh wish it, well it. the price has been coming down on it. it's been on sale a couple of times so it my my boss uh that i've been working with the mentoring group that he has uh just bought some for like 140 bucks each but they it can be reconfigured to three different robots mm -hmm. yeah oh but they I have mean, a they have a hobby. lower cost one you can get it down to 80 bucks retail if you just go with the Mbot, not the Mbot Ranger. Correct, correct. That's true. Yeah, they have different scaled um, robots that are simpler. Um, so it's still, yeah, it still could be explorable if your price range is lower than that. I realize that that's not for everybody's, uh, all the students' price range. Uh, but it is very, very nice how modular it is. It's the sort of thing that if I can get like the parents to want to invest in a robot for the kids yeah. to use. That seems like a really good choice right there. Yeah. Or half and half it, you know, that the, the kids are in half the cost of the robot and the parents cover the other half kind of engages them in a different way where they're, they're invested in it. So they're not just treating the robot like a toy. Um, but and, and you know, that, that's a thought too. And I was going to say fundraising is a really good skill for people to learn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we're just about there. Two, one. All righty. Dun dun dun. <laughs> so with that, the appetizers have been served, and I will turn this over to Bob to for the main course. How's that? How's that? I just thought of that up. Thought that up, Bob. <laughs> it's a bit of a strange way to do it, but okay. <laughs> I think I'm projecting my screen. Yes, you are, and not the that first true? time I've been called strange, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so, just by the nature of how Zoom uh, works, you know, it's hard for me to see. I don't see the chat. I don't really see the pictures. Uh, so I won't be able to, to kind of interact with people as I'm going through this. But uh, what I will do is say, uh, you know, I'll, I definitely have time at the end for questions. Um, I, I basically built uh, this with the idea of I'll run through the content, uh, then we can spend as much time on questions uh, or as little time as needed. So we'll go from there. So thanks very much, uh, I guess, to the SRS and everybody who came out today and anybody viewing this uh, recording. I wanted to talk about uh, kind of my uh, personal journey, I guess, with the Robo Magellan contest and and my robot. This is uh, my latest robot. And particularly, I'm going to focus a little bit on um, the, you know, kind of cone detection problem. Uh, so everybody needs a, a you know, headline grabbing title. Uh, this is mine. Um, Maybe if I'd actually put this on the uh, on the title of the presentation, uh, more people would uh, would view it. It's just that kind of fun stuff. Um, about me, I wasn't going to talk a lot about this. It's just you know essentially here's some contact info. Uh, I do have a background in software development. I've uh, been around for a long time. I currently work for a cybersecurity firm, uh, managing uh, engineering teams, uh, keeps me busy, and unfortunately not enough time to build robots, but I try. Um, some notes. 
So uh, I also uh, do mini sumo robots. Uh, the Thin Man is uh, my most recent one that uh, has been uh, a lot of fun to run. Um, but I also have some, you know, quote unquote legalese, I guess, uh, where it's, you know, sort of, yeah, I hope you have came with the right expectations. This is a hobby for me. I'm not a professional in any of this stuff. But I am going to share kind of how I got to where I got to and, and the outcomes of that. Um, and by no means do I think this is the only way to, to do a Robo Magellan robot. Um, and in the Dallas group, uh, they have a, a slightly different, almost similar, but different contest called Robo Columbus. Um, and, and by the way, I have a link in the appendix to some videos they did recently from back in November. And, and great stuff to watch because you see very different approaches to uh, how you might build one of these kinds of robots. Um, this is today's uh, topic, so I'm going to just do a very quick uh, review. I'm pretty sure everybody knows what Robo Magellan is, but I'll just do it anyways. Uh, my robot is named Ferdy, uh, so I'll do a quick intro there. And then we're going to spend the bulk of the time talking about how is it that you can uh, detect orange cones. Um, and, and I ended up with a machine learning approach. Uh, so uh, Lloyd was kind enough to not steal my thunder and talk too much about uh, image uh, prediction with YOLO, but uh, we'll get there. And I'll, I'm going to go through the whole thing of how would you do this? How'd you get started, et cetera. Um, so the Robo Magellan contest, uh, it actually was inspired by uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge that was first run in 2004. Uh, and, and probably everybody remembers, that was the idea of uh, full-size vehicles autonomously navigating uh, interesting terrain out in the desert. And the SRS decided to create something that was more small scale. So this is kind of a you know, hobby version of this. Um, the, the general idea in this text comes literally from Wikipedia, but the, it's, it's a, played in an outdoor park and you're navigating uh, between waypoints uh, and, and the, the cones themselves represent the goal. Uh, there can be multiples of them. And of course, because you're in a park, you've got curbs and trees and bushes and sometimes people. Uh, this is a picture from the first event, uh, shows the first people that were building uh, these robots. It was in 2004. Uh, so some people probably will recognize uh, some of the people up on the stage there. It was uh, quite a, uh, a fun day and has been played many times since then. I um, wanted to just introduce my robot again, kind of a little navigation of where we're at. Uh, so this is a side view of Ferdy. Uh, you can kind of see there's a chassis here. It's a six wheeled robot. Uh, the uh, mechanic, mechanical parts of it here, uh, it's based on a mind's eye super rover kit, uh, which was uh, much with much appreciation, uh, a gift from uh, Carol Hazlitt, who had worked with that company quite a bit. Uh, it's about the size of a one-tenth scale RC truck, uh, and I think that makes about the right size for this kind of a thing. Um, I've seen people build bigger. I've seen people build smaller. I don't think that uh, there's a wrong way to do it, uh, but what my experience has been that this is about the right size uh, to deal with curbs and hills and bumps and you know who knows what else you might find in a park. Um, all the bumper sensor stuff uh, that you see on the top there was was my design, uh, a couple batteries, and then the electronics, this is the top down view. The electronics are all uh, mounted onto Syndra. It's extruded uh, 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 PVC. It's it's very lightweight, but sturdy uh, and, and dense enough uh, that you can actually just screw, put screws directly into it. You don't need to uh, even put bolts on it unless you're really worried about it. But yeah, all the electronics is just screwed right down onto the Syndra. Um, the electronics themselves uh, is based around two compute platforms. One is a Teensy. I was using a Teensy 3.6 and a Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, so some, you can kind of think of it as all the you know, low-level control is managed by the Teensy. So it, it deals with sensors and it talks to the motor controller. Uh, and it talks to the encoder and steering servos. And, and the, the Robo Magellan event requires a, a remote uh, kind of switch that you can disable the movement of the robot for safety reasons. So I use a 315 megahertz uh, receiver for that. And then on the right side is the Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's using the, the uh, Raspberry Pi camera. 
So that's where it's getting its images, that's image acquisition for looking for cones, and then for all the diagnostics and, and display of using uh, just an uh, Adafruit display. And uh, weirdly enough, the Raspberry Pi doesn't really have a real-time clock. Uh, it normally boots up, connects to the internet, grabs the time from uh, an NTP server or something. But of course, on my robot, I don't have that. So I put a real-time clock on there so I can get correct and accurate uh, timestamps in all of my logs and everything. I think the uh, Raspberry Pi 5 might have a real-time clock now. I think you're right. Yeah. And, and you know, like, like everything, if you just wait long enough, everything, all of your problems get solved with new versions of something. Um, so the gist of all of this, though, for the Robo Magellan event is how do you detect orange cones? Um, and, and my journey through this has started with a couple of the kind of more classic uh, image processing techniques. And, and color blob detection is one of the, the basic uh, kind of vision uh, algorithms. Uh, you say that I want to find something that's vaguely orange, and then I flood fill. I kind of look around in the image. Map, you're obviously writing code to do this. But you can look around for similar pixels of that color, and and then you know once you get your blob, uh, you can try to rule out some false positives with uh, some heuristics like it should be a certain size, it should be a certain orientation. Uh, you can even look for you know like is it a vaguely triangular shape? Um, and in fact, if you don't want to program this, uh, you can get a bunch of uh, off-the-shelf uh, kind of products that do this: uh, the AVR Cam, CMU, CMU Cam, Pixie Cam, uh, OpenMV. I've owned them all, uh, and, and I own them all with the hope that just that next one I bought would be the one to help uh, make this all work for me. And I had really not great results, not because they're not great products. They do exactly what they're supposed to do. It's just that this is an outdoor event. So um, it, it, we as humans, we can look at this picture and say, aha, I know exactly where the orange cone is. That's a pretty easy thing to find. Uh, and, and that technique that I described, you go around and you hunt for some pixels and then you kind of, you know, expand your blob, you can eventually find that, yay, there's a, there's a cone and I can actually write code that does that. Um, the biggest weakness of this approach turns out to be, uh, it, it, by the nature of being outdoors, you don't have great control of lighting. Uh, and and the people who set up the uh, Rovan Magellan course are some, sometimes insidious, putting it in shadows or hiding behind trees. Uh, so you don't always know what you're in for. And therefore, trying to match what's an orange pixel can be quite difficult. Again, as humans, we look at this and it's not a problem. We can easily find the cone. Writing code to do this uh, is more tricky uh, without some sort of advanced knowledge of the image that you're looking through. There's another example. Uh, this isn't orange. Uh, this is more yellow than orange. So you know, the kind of look uh, look at look for orange things isn't going to be particularly helpful in this picture. So this is kind of my own experience that um, outdoor applications where you don't control the background or the lighting or something, uh, blob detection is is a bit hit and miss. Um, so the next thing that I moved on to was uh, basically, you know, kind of more advanced image filtering. And, and I always talk about this in the context that this stuff is, is exactly, you write code to basically do what, what you would describe to another person. Uh, if you were trying to say, let's find an orange cone in a picture, I can write some code to basically do that. So the idea is that, uh, it, and this is just one approach, you, you, can, you can basically reduce the, the uh, variability of color um, by manipulating the color space, and then you start to look for edges, uh, and then and then you can basically again supply some heuristics about the things that you found. And OpenCV is probably the most common uh, library that you might use to actually do this. So if we take this image again, uh, we say, okay, so the first thing we want to do is drop all the colors uh, except for red in the red color space. Uh, red orange, in fact, and then amplify the red orange. And that's why you get the kind of orange coming out of what was the grass. That's a that's kind of brownish grass. Um, but it makes the, the the orange cone pop really well. And that's that's actually helpful. And then and then what you can do is basically start doing horizontal scans uh, to find your hard edges. Uh, you're basically looking for the gradient uh, shift from kind of you know one particular kind of color or hue into another. 
And you can then repeat that process over and over and over again horizontally. And you will eventually say, okay, I can find those vertical uh, points and, and come with up with some edges. And, and in this particular picture, that's a, a pretty good way to approach the problem. Uh, it also works in this kind of a picture where the cone is slightly tilted. Um, by the way, these are images actually taken from my robot. So these are, you know, kind of going through the Pixie, or sorry, the uh, Raspberry Pi cam and such. Um, and then this this is also another picture. Uh, and this is essentially also going to apply the same technique. Um, the problem is, is that if you're just looking for gradients, uh, the change in, you know, sharp change in, in kind of the, the pixels, uh, you're going to end up finding a bunch of them. And so what I really struggled with, uh, with this approach was that, um, you, you can find cones, but you can find a lot more than just cones. And this is, you know, a little bit of a specific example, but, you know, it's, it's kind of odd when you start looking around, uh, particularly with this approach of kind of look for edges, uh, look for things that are orange. Um, this is, this is kind of a, a, a complicated process. It, it's a bit fragile, typically in the sense of, of the algorithms, uh, take a lot of work to make, to make effective. I do believe people can do it. I think that there's some people with the talent uh, and the knowledge and and perhaps the training and experience in machine vision that can do it this way. I I was not really able to do it very well, very effectively. Um, but I do think it's possible. But I was looking for a different approach, and so I I uh, you know all the rage these days is is machine learning or or AI. Uh, machine learning, uh, this is a, a kind of a definition from Wikipedia. Uh, it, it basically says, I've got some statistical algorithms uh, that can you know, process input data and provide some output uh, data. And you want to perform tasks without explicit instructions. So in the context of orange cone finding, color, color blob detection is kind of, you know, I think of it as an explicit instruction. You're going to go look for, for colors of a particular uh, in a particular range, and then kind of do, expand that into a blob, et cetera. The same with kind of trying to do this with edge detections and color space manipulations. Those are explicit instructions. And, and when it came to kind of my approach, uh, my understanding, my thinking of, of ML, it's basically the statistical algorithm stuff is really, it's a magic black box. And, and I probably, that's probably not the first time you've heard that description. Uh, and it, and it's, it's somewhat accurate, actually. So if we take a, another picture of a cone uh, and we thought of like, okay, how do we apply a machine learning approach to finding an orange cone? Um, what really is going on here is you have this picture and you have a model. So pictures are pixels. Pixels are just numbers. So imagine taking all of those numbers and running them through your, your kind of magical black box. Uh, and, and as you do all of that, then you end up coming out with this kind of a, a prediction. Um, with machine learning, everything is a prediction uh, and, and it gives you a, a, a statistical kind of uh, percentage of, you know, kind of confidence. So in this example, you know, you can think of it as this, this black box, this model produces out a, a bounding box uh, of where the cone would be and a, a uh, certainty or a confidence level of 87%. And this is quite literally how this kind of stuff works. If we dig into, you know, kind of a more accurate version, uh, neural networks will often show a picture like this. This just happens to be uh, an image from the datascientist.com, uh, but it really talks about kind of, or show visually gives you a better idea of what's happening inside that black box. Neural networks are kind of uh, mathematical algorithms that you take a bunch of input data and you then work through a number of transformations and the output of each step is an input to the next step until you finally end up at the output layer at the very far end with some sort of answer, uh, some sort of confidence. And, and so you can kind of imagine what's really happening here is you shove all your pixels through from uh, the left side, and it kind of works its way through these mathematical transformations and gets all the way to the output with some sort of statistical results. And, and now the trick is, um, 
if you had to actually work out the the little transformations in each of those gray circles, you'd be at it for a very long time. Uh, we could all imagine kind of having to sit and try an experiment with with this, try, trying different values, trying different uh, kind of numbers or, or weights, so to speak, uh, in each of these little gray bubbles. And, and we would spend a lot of time doing that by hand. The good news is, this is what good machines are good for. And so the idea is that what you can do is take your, your data set, run the images through it to get the result, and then kind of start to tweak. And, and this is what these training algorithms do is they start to tweak all these weights, the numbers in those gray bubbles, working out kind of a way of making it more accurate. How do you get the results out the end that you're looking for? And this is training. This is what we refer to as training. So um, I thought like, hey, this all looks approachable. A little uh, Googling on the web uh, turns up this company, uh, this organization called Ultralytics. And they, they make uh, this very approachable. The headline here was very exciting to me. It says train AI models in seconds. So that sounds really great. Um, also made it sound like it was actually going to be pretty easy. Uh, so they they have on their website and in fact uh the collab uh tutorial for yolo that uh, uh was shown earlier um that lloyd was showing uh had the same code but you can find this on the on the website and this is literally the the python prediction code so you can see it's really quite short uh there's not a lot of complication here and all the hard work is done for you by the uh ultralytics python library and you load the model and then you give it a couple images. In this case, two images. In my case, I'm just one image. And it gives you back some results. And literally it's like, it gives you back as Python objects to give you the bounding box confidence and a few other kind of pieces of metadata. I'm like, okay, I can, I can actually do that on my robot. I've got the Raspberry Pi. I do uh, all the high level control of my robot is in Python already. So this looks really quite uh, uh, kind of solvable in the sense of works, it'll work for me. And, and then it's like, okay, but that training phase is gonna be really hard. And it turns out it's not. Uh, they give you a command line uh, that you can use. It's YOLO detect train, and then it's a bunch of parameters here. Uh, of course, the, the important part is you have to describe your data set. And so uh, this is the data set, literally the data set file that I was using for my robot. Um, and I'm going to give it a bunch of images and I'm going to give it a bunch of validation and, and such. So this all looked possible. Right? This was for me, um, something that I could actually solve something I could actually do practically, uh, as a hobbyist. And so then it was the, you know, kind of, okay, what, what else is there? So, um, I just stuck this in here so that other people know YOLO has some interesting licensing and it's totally available. It's open source. You can go get the code. You can read the code. It's okay. Um, it's complicated as you'd imagine. It's built on a lot of other people's code as well, but specifically Ultralytics makes YOLO and, and here I'm talking about YOLO V8 for sure uh, is available under the AGPL 3.0. And the one thing that they do stipulate is that all the models and any software that you're using, particularly for commercial pro, uh, applications, has to follow that license, or you have to go to them to get a uh, what they call an enterprise license. You can pay to build products that are not going to be licensed under the AGPL. Um, so this is just no. If you're going to use it as a hobbyist, it's probably not that important. If you're going to think about using this kind of uh, an approach for other applications, uh, you at least know before you code. So now, how does machine learning work? Uh, this is kind of the heart of what we're really going to get into today, training your own model. And so back to kind of my premise for the Rogan Magellan contest, my robot needs to roll around and then find orange cones, approach them and touch the cone. And so uh, I wanted to do this by literally training a data set, uh, training, training a model with a data set of cones. So you have to collect the images, then there's a process called labeling. Labeling is literally just showing, like painting the picture to say, this is the cone. Because again, if you remember training is all about starting with, with that big neural network, and then you have to kind of get the, 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 the process of tweaking, tuning, 
updating all of those weights to give you the outcomes that you want. So labeling is basically saying, okay, in this image, this is where the cone that I want to detect is. Uh, the training process, it literally is that one line, uh, command line, of course, but you've got to back it up with all the, the labeled images. Uh, testing uh, kind of is inherent in all of that, and then deployment to the, to the robot. Um, so this is basically like, okay, I've got to collect images. So I just put Ferdy on the job and said, Ferdy, go, go collect images for me. This is just a video. What I did is I wrote a program to drive the robot forward and every few seconds grab a, uh, a picture from the camera and then just save it. And so I did this and I did quite a bit of it. And the great thing is, is basically like I'm collecting images from the robot and I just would go out in the park, go out wherever around my house, say, okay, I need to collect some images and uh, put the robot down, put the cone down, let it just drive and collect images for me. Um, there wasn't a lot of thought needed in terms of planning. Uh, you get a lot of natural variety just by basically doing that uh, out in the out in the wild. Here's some pictures of cones uh, in a parking garage. Uh, <laughs> it looks like it's a black and white picture with a big orange cone. It just happens to be it's gray concrete, and most people seem to own black or white vehicles. Uh, but you can kind of get a sense of some of the variety of, of images that I'd collected. Uh, here's some more images. You've seen some of these already. Uh, so need negative cases. So you need to be able to have an image that might be very similar background, very similar content, but doesn't actually contain a cone. It's, it's basically a reinforcement to say, these images are, are containing the thing I want to detect. Here's some very similar images that don't have the object that I want to detect. And so that gets us a data set. Uh, now you need to do the labeling. I used a program called Rect Label Pro. There's a number of these things out there that allow you to create these. Um, I just happened to stumble into this one. It runs very well in my Mac. And I think it was about 25 bucks or something from the App Store. And the idea is that you go through and you manually annotate all your images. Uh, and, and it literally is painting. Uh, kind of like a, a paint program or something. So the cyan cone in the middle is is the object of interest that I was trying to uh, label. And this is just a bigger version of that same uh, program program window. And again, you're just painting it, literally just painting it. And I got good enough that, you know, after a little bit of practice, I was painting uh, cones in, in, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds each. So it's not a laborious process. Uh, you're not spending hours on these things. You're just doing them and you just need to do it quick. And and uh, if you're really not wanting to do it, you can actually outsource this kind of stuff. There's tons of, uh, you know, fiber type things or mechanical Turk type uh, operations that you can do. They just get pay somebody else to label things for you. Turns out it's a very common problem for a lot of people. So when, when this program stores the data, basically like you start with the image. So the one on the left is from the robot. The one on the right is the mask. So you're creating that in the uh, in the labeling program. Um, this is uh, then our, our mask. Uh, also gets some uh, XML annotation that's stored. But the really important part is all that gets transformed into something like this. And this is, it's actually a single line, but uh, this is what's called the YOLO format. Um, it's it's what their library and what their their software is expecting to train on. And, and this is a little deceptive because this is actually all on one line of text. It's just wrapped uh, when I paste it into the, uh, into the presentation. But the idea here is that you'll notice a couple things going on. One is there's lots of data points. So this is actually uh, showing uh, kind of a polygon um, of the, the area of interest in the image. Um, and it's also scaled such that the full image size is, is on the scale horizontally uh, from zero to one and from vertically zero to one as well. And so the idea is you're gonna collect a bunch of this stuff and then you're gonna label it. Um, and Ultralytics, uh, they, they recommend that, you know, if you're training some new uh, feature, then you need to collect, you know, 1500 or more images uh, that contain your features. You want uh, your images from different times of day, different seasons, different weather. Uh, you know, different lighting, different angles, different sources. 
that that's kind of their recommendations and it and it and it kind of becomes obvious when you think about it you're you're going to be getting all of those weights kind of trained in that neural network uh, based on your input data and the validation of of the labeled uh, features you also want to have a separate validation set of labeled images uh, that's again their recommendation and and they they suggest 10% uh, or more of your images uh you should you basically should be the negative cases you need to be able to provide data so this was where i started to get uh, a bit worried like 1500 images is is doable um but but it turns out they they actually say okay well you know that's what we recommend in general so so this is what i ended up with um, so my experience, I collected up 357 images from Ferdy uh, by literally, as I showed before, I look, you know, put the cone down, put Ferdy on the ground, press a button, and Ferdy would drive forward, snapping pictures occasionally. And uh, that then got, got me a, a fairly good data set. And the, the hard work literally was moving the robot and the cone around to different areas around the neighborhood. And... And so uh, I ended up with 227 positive images. So basically each of them contained a cone. Uh, and, and you can, they say you can, and so I gave it a shot. You can use your, your training set as validation. So if you think of this feedback loop of, of the training is going to set a bunch of weights, um, and then it's going to test all of that against your validation data set. So you do the trainings data set and then validate how how well did you do and it's an iterative process. Um, so I didn't do that. I just used the same data set for validation. Actually worked out okay. Uh, and the other thing is, you I didn't start out from zero. I actually used uh, what's known as the Coco data set. Uh, Yolo basically comes with it. These are these are basically. It's a machine learning model that's already been trained to recognize fairly common uh, objects, uh, automobiles, people, um, dogs, cats, birds, like just, you know, a number of different things. And these things are basically trained in very generic circumstances. So they're, they're, they're the ones that are worried about lots of different sources, lots of different backgrounds, lots of different uh, lighting conditions, et cetera. So you kind of start with this pre-trained uh, weights. Uh, and then it's really just the training involves modifying those weights and validating against it. So the training uh, is, as I say, it's an iterative pro uh, process. So it automatically loops through and, and is, is altering weights and trying to see what the outcomes are, better or not. Uh, the first attempt, literally, when I ran my data set through this, I ran it on a, a fairly OK machine. Um, it ran for 67 hours. Uh, the Python process crashed. It grew to 12 gigabytes and and pretty much crashed uh, crashed out uh, without a result. There was there was nothing to be had, and and I was ready to despair. But then I I uh, remembered some advice that I heard about machine learning, and we've all heard this now. And and Lloyd made uh, reference to this in uh, Colab. It, GPUs are are definitely important. Uh, there's a reason that everybody wants to buy up GPUs for machine learning these days. So I got on a Windows gaming laptop that, again, you know, isn't particularly uh, spiffy, other than it has a very nice uh, GPU in it for gaming, and and it made all the difference in the world. I literally ran through the whole uh, training uh, set in under four hours. Uh, which all of a sudden now made this quite tractable because I could actually then iterate in the sense of adding more images and, and such to it. And after four hours, it popped out and said, here's your model. It's all done. Um, the thing is basically uh, it, it, the, the binary blob is, is of, this, of this neural network is about six megabytes of the smallest size. And you can get much more bigger, even much bigger, more sophisticated networks if you want. But I'm using the smallest one. It's a little over six megabytes in size. So as part of the training it actually and, and the validation process, it actually stores and saves all the images and then kind of checks itself. And, and the, the YOLO software actually produces these images. These are annotated. Uh, so it's highlighting uh, the object that it detects. So I called the object the feature cone. So it, it highlighted cone and then also gives you the uh, probability uh, of it being an accurate detection. So no surprise, these are all particularly good because again, this was the training set and validation set kind of feeding it into itself. 
So here's some uh, close-ups of those image of some of those images. Uh, again, cones in, and some high probability. Uh, the lower right-hand corner one was really interesting because I didn't expect to get the dog or the person in the picture. It was just, again, had the robot set up and it was taking pictures and somebody was walking their dog and walked in, in between. And I was happy it didn't detect the person, uh, not surprised. It also didn't detect the dog, but it did detect the cone and it did so with 97% uh, probability. So the results were, were good so far. Um, but, you know, the question I had to ask myself is why, is, why did this work so well in this particular sense? Um, when, when the Ultralytics kind of recommendations and, and a number of other sources that you can find online talk about machine learning data sets, they are talking, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of images. Um, and, and I think that this worked really well for me because I was using the exact same camera on the robot uh, to gather the training data as I was going to be using it in the real world. Um, the application is also very constrained. I'm not trying to detect lots of different objects under lots of different conditions uh, from different cameras and such. I have one camera, it's on the robot, it's always going to be the same view or perspective, uh, and, and I'm looking for one type of object that actually, when you think about it, the orange cone does stand out quite well. This is a picture in my kitchen, and, and even indoors it works quite well. Um, and, and all the training data I, I got was in reasonably similar weather conditions and reasonably similar backgrounds and, and obviously the same target feature that we would see in the real Robo Magellan run. Um, I also had looked, I knew uh, the, the site that Robo Magellan was going to run in this year, this past September. Uh, and so I looked it up on Google uh, Earth and I could see, okay, you know, it's, it's outdoors, it's grassy. Um, it's not, you know, there's no snow and it's not full of leaves or anything like that. It's basically going to be an environment that I can go create uh, a data set that's going to be reasonably similar to. So I think that actually the the results um, were were very good because that happened because of these kind of constraints. Um, so then the next question is like, okay, what to do with the uh, model? Let's put it onto the robot. So everything to date was all running on the laptop and and taking images that I'd taken from the robot and then run the, the prediction and see what happened. So now it was time to put it onto the robot. So again, with the Raspberry Pi, the 6.2 megabyte binary file. Um, and because I was writing it in Python, I pretty much used exactly the same code that their sample has. Uh, and instead of loading the, the Coco model like their sample did, I loaded my own. Um, and, and basically, I also wrote the code to save uh, every image. So every image that I took, I was already saving, and that's how I was collecting data. But now, every time I was running a, a detection, or I guess a prediction is the more uh, correct term, then I would save the results of the prediction. I would save the image, and I'd annotate it if it had a detection in it. And I'd save the, all the metadata that got spit out by the, uh, the YOLO code, the YOLO library. And, and if you're not familiar with, there's a, a, a pillow or a PIL package in Python that's super easy to use. You can take an image, load it up inside this uh, uh, this this library and uh, add annotations. So all the annotations that you're going to see going forward that are that are from my code are all just done that way. And it's a super easy way to do it. And and it turned out saving the uh, images was, was really handy because then I could go back and review and, and even think about kind of is, is everything working as, as well as I thought. And then I also put a test mode on the robot uh, for easy experimentation. So I could, you know, again, kind of go validate manually whether I thought it was working well. So this is a little video of that test mode on the robot. Uh, sorry for the shaking of the camera. I was trying to hold my iPhone in one hand and push buttons on the other hand. But uh, this is again in, in my kitchen. And so this is what it comes back with. It gives you back some analytics. Uh, on the screen uh, and it gives the bounding box for what it saw. So I could actually move the robot around and press the, the test button and it would uh, then give me back the result. And it turned out to be just, you know, one of those kind of very handy things to validate. It was working as I thought. Um, this is actually a, a picture from the event back on September 9th. Uh, that was from the robot and uh, the, the cone detection. It was one of the, the cones. This was while I was out testing the robot in the morning. 
And uh, you can also see there's two small cones in the back and, and my code only uses the, the first object detected. Uh, I did discover later that I probably would have detected those if, if, uh, if, if it had given it a chance. And this is the kind of uh, metadata that I was saving. I saved the confidence, the how long did it take, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Zone is uh, an interesting, it's a concept I came up with where if you think of the image being in five separate kind of vertical slices, kind of equal slices, uh, I would lay, I would give it uh, an idea of the zone that I found the center of the cone in. And I used that later for kind of thinking about when the robot was gonna have to move, how much steer uh, would I have to, how, mu how much would I wanna steer towards the cone? So the zone idea was kind of my own application on top of it. It was really just the sense of putting this on top of, um, just knowing where it was meant I had some idea of turn hard or not turn hard. So I was really happy. Uh, the results were excellent. Uh, I'm just foreshadowing. If you uh, uh, watched any of the videos that I posted about this, you'll probably see some interesting results. But what I did find is that actually, like in, in general, the, the the false positives were were zero in all of my own testing before September 9th. Um, and and near zero, really, even during the run of the event. And and it ran well enough on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, like the Pi doesn't have a GPU. Um, it's not a super spiffy uh, compute platform, um, but you know it works okay. The prediction uh, for this particular model and, and such is about 1.6 seconds, which means in this sense, I was not gonna be able to do this in real time. So no real time prediction means I, I ended up with kind of a strategy of do the do the detection or take a picture, do a prediction, uh, move in that direction for a little bit, and then stop and repeat and kind of this rinse and repeat thing. This is a video of that actually happening in progress, and and you kind of see and this is again just out testing in a local park, and you see that the uh, robot will will advance a little bit and then it's going to start moving the camera. So. I mounted the Raspberry Pi camera on a servo so it can kind of swivel uh, and, and it, it kind of goes around through the 180 degree arc in front of the robot looking for uh, taking pictures, running the prediction and, and deciding which is maybe uh, going to be the right angle to store or to uh, find the cone. So it's actually uh, now it's gotten its first acquisition of it and it's gonna move. You'll see it's actually turning in a bit of an arc. Uh, that's because it, it knows approximately from the angle of the camera and the uh, area of the zone, so to speak, of the, the image where it was. Um, but again, because it's not, I can't really do the processing in real time on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, I had to do the strategy of then stop and then start looking again. And it'll take a second here to kind of uh, move the, the camera, pan the camera around. Um, this is a particularly, you know, kind of worst case scenario in the sense that if it doesn't see the, the cone right in front of it, uh, it starts at the very far left and then has to sweep around. And so it, it's gonna take a second here, but it will find the cone and then it's gonna find it again and start advancing on it. Um, and uh, it, it's hard to tell from this video. There's a little bump in the ground. That's why it paused. It wasn't really doing, it was just kind of, it had the PID loop at this point wasn't particularly very well refined. So I had to kind of climb up a small bump. And then uh, it's gonna do its last prediction here. It sees the cone right in front of it and now it's gonna drive forward. And uh, I think it actually just is a, it's a, it's a near miss. It's one of the problems of this approach that I did discover is that the, uh, the this idea of, of kind of having to, to say, okay, I think it's in that direction and then move forward means it might not hit it, hit it dead on. It did end up uh, kind of hitting the base, which is enough of a count. So I was uh, pretty happy about it. This is a similar video, it kind of shows more of the robot's behavior uh, when it's doing all the detection or the predictions and, and such. So at this point, the robot was driving towards a waypoint uh, so the GPS waypoint got me to this point here. Um, and now what the robot had to do was detect kind of where does it see the cone? So it gets to a particular waypoint, stops, starts pivoting the camera around to find it. It has some uh, heuristics to see like, oh, okay, I found it on the very left-hand side. 
I will then back up and take another attempt at it. Uh, if it doesn't see the cone at all, it does something similar where it'll back up and go in circles uh, for a little while until it tries to, until it is able to acquire the cone. And and in this particular sense, you, know, you can kind of get the sense of the, the camera pivoting on the servo. And it will then say, oh, right, okay, here's the, here's the cone. Uh, it finds it again. Um, there's a little bit of, of uh, what somebody referred to as body language going on in the camera. So after it finds a detection, it, it pivots the camera back to the front and then pivots again back to the p direction that it saw the cone. Uh, so me as an observer, I can actually kind of know, oh, that's what happened. And so uh, if, you, if you watch the recordings that I made from the September 9th, uh day uh, i'm talking about oh i think i'm pretty sure it got the cone or i did this that's that's how i did it there's no offboard uh telemetry or anything at this point to to know it's all about how the how the robot behaves and knowing all of that i can tell from its body language so to speak so at this point it's gone up it's approached the cone it's touched the cone and then it will back away and now it's going to be going on to the next uh waypoint I think we're just about done with the video there. So it's thinking about what to do next. But yeah, there we go. So now it's going to turn itself around. And the next waypoint was actually behind me. So that's why I'm backing up here and going to give it some room. So um yeah, so the summary is uh like machine learning. It worked really well. So this is uh, vision processing object uh, or feature detection or feature prediction with machine learning. And as a hobbyist, this turned out to be very practical. Um, and this this is you know, there, there, if if you're worried about building a robot Magellan robot because you don't know how to detect orange cones, uh, hopefully this is uh, kind of giving you the confidence that you can do that. Um, it, it worked very well for me. I'm really happy with the results. Uh, the, the things I think that I would do different going forward, a um, few different things. One is that that image prediction thing is way too long. 1.6 seconds is, is way too long. Um, and it's not really a speed race in my mind. It, it is in the sense that the there's there's points in the Robo Majon scoring system for speed. But um, I wanted to get to closer to being able to do it in real time. And so, uh, some sort of people have made the suggestion that what I should, what I could do, is uh, use smaller images, and that's probably true. Um, Lloyd had linked to the collab uh, kind of tutorial. One of the things that they talked about in there is is that there's other ways of saving the model that makes it go faster as well. Um, and, and the other thing that you can do uh, that I thought was a brilliant uh, suggestion from, from someone was to say, okay, use the machine learning model to find the cone in the image. And now you found that cone, you can actually just start doing uh, blob tracking, right? Because you can map onto that image. That's the orange color that I'm actually going to look for. And, then, and you can do blob tracking or image correlation. And actually, that kind of stuff can be absolutely done in real time on a pod. So that that would that might be another approach. What I've ended up with is uh, investing in a in a uh, in an Nvidia uh, Jetson Orin. Uh, it's a nice uh, uh, kind of basically it's it's kind of like a Raspberry Pi with a really nice GPU on it. And and I've done some early testing with the the same trained model. So on the Pi, it took 1.6 seconds. On the Orin, it uh, is taking in the neighborhood of about 15 milliseconds. So it's actually quite practical as I'm driving around with the robot to do that in real time. So that's that's probably the next step that I'll do for the evolution of that. Um, so th there's other stuff I could talk about. I, I don't have, uh, I didn't have a lot of time today. <laughs> But you know, there's other stuff that people might be interested in. Uh, so the, all the behaviors, the strategies of how it works for my robot, I'd be happy to talk about that at some future point. Uh, one of the other things that I feel is very important for the scale of a contest is testing. Uh, you have to do lots of testing uh, to get things right. Um, you, there's some fairly complex behaviors you're probably gonna wanna build in. To do lots of testing, the other thing I did is I built a telemetry system so that I record everything that happens uh, everything that the Teensy is is doing with what sensor readings it gets, 
what uh, it's doing with servos, what does the IMU say, what does the GPS say. That's all getting recorded about 10, 10 times a second now. Um, it's all being recorded locally on the Pi. So the Teensy sends it up every, you know, kind of 10 times a second up to the Pi, and the Pi uses that for some of its higher level strategy. But more importantly, I record it so that later I can actually uh, visualize it and, and go review what happened. Um, I've seen a lot of people uh, worried about getting telemetry off the, the robot in real time, you know, and you can imagine kind of following the robot around with a laptop. I, I didn't find that particularly useful. I tried it a little bit, but then you got to worry about like, oh, I've got my uh, Wi-Fi network or something. I, and in the end, it didn't matter. All I really needed to do was collect a bunch of data and then be able to analyze it offline uh, to know, you know, kind of even simple things like was my how effective was my PID uh, tuning. You can actually do it that way. How good is uh, are the ultrasonic sensors working for object detection? Um, all of that is easy to analyze after the fact and just record all the data. And, and of course, like, I think the Robo Magellan event is great. I wish more people would build robots. So, you know, the last uh, statement here is just, you know, what's stopping you from building it? And and what can I do? What, what can uh, everyone else who's building these things do to promote it? So um, um, with that, oh, I'm going to kind of... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was going to open the floor to questions. Uh, I'm also going to take a drink of water because I've been talking for quite a while. And I have a bit of a cold, so yeah, hopefully it's all been uh, intelligible. Yeah, so I have a, a, I guess just a comment and then a question. The, the first thing is I just love that idea of, of like taking the, the machine language recognition and then using that to set the blob colors for, for faster tracking. I, I'm kind of torqued that I didn't think of that myself because uh, I've, I've now realized there's like, a gob of, of uh, possibilities for me to use that in, in future projects. Um, the question I had actually was, uh, have you thought about or have you tried using a lower resolution for the machine learning scan to, to get like, a, oh, maybe that's a cone, and then doing a higher resolution confirmation where you reuse a higher resolution picture, but you cut out that area and send it to the machine learning system just to get like a valid confirmation of it. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. And and so my actually what I've I've been doing some reading and and I haven't done a ton of testing, but uh the the kind of image prediction time is very much a function of how much data you have to crunch through the neural network. So smaller images are definitely going to run faster. But it doesn't seem to change the results as long as you're actually, and again, I'm just using a very small data set, but because it was the same camera, same images, same, you know, kind of formats and same size, um, I was getting really good results. And I think that you can actually use much smaller pictures. A lot of the the commercially available data sets, the Cocoa data set, for example, those things are all trained on like images like 128 pixels square. It's amazingly small. And, and had I known that, I probably would have uh, reduced the resolution of all the data I was collecting for training and then the resolution of it running on the robot. Um, as it was, I, I kind of got diluted into the idea of using larger images with better resolution would give me better outcomes. So I was using 640 by 480 images. And, and I think a fraction of that size would probably be sufficient. Uh, yeah, that's, that's actually really been testing it looks that way. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's I don't been think my it's going to matter that much. <clears throat> Lower resolution images, at least for a first shot. The only problem I've had with them is, um, like, if you're looking for an April tag, you have to get above a certain point before it's going to recognize it as an April tag. But what you can do is, like, if you generally know that there's going to be a white April tag on a darker surface, you know, you can grab a very low resolution image and, and, cut out all of the white areas and then go in and take a high resolution image and then just cut out those areas and go, is that an April tag? Is that an April tag? Is that an April tag? Um, the, the problem with doing that is that you don't get the uh, super accurate XYZ um, positioning data that you can get from an April tag. Uh, but sometimes you don't need that. You just need to know, you know, like in general, it's over there sort of a thing. Um, so for this kind of an application, it seems like it would work like, like really well um yeah 
Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, and you could even have two different models, right? So one that's looking for that white, white-ish blob at low res, and then a yeah. second model that you can apply at a higher resolution uh, just to, to, to get the details of the April tag. Mm -hmm. there, there's another technique I've come across. So this is from the tiny ML space. So the, the tiny ML space is running on super, super small um, processors like the um, Arduino Nano, for instance, you know, can can run this YOLO um, algorithm. It takes like 19 seconds to, to process an image, right? So order of magnitude slower again, or order of magnitude half slower. Um, but one of the techniques they th throw in there is not only using a smaller image, but using a smaller model. So this, you drop the precision of the floating point even all the way down to one bit, right? And so you you basically run a a really tiny model against a tiny image, and um, with the idea that you've trained the model to get false positives. But when you get a false positive, now you go run a bigger model that's more accurate. <laughs> and so you're scaling and you're scaling the model dimension as well as the image dimension. I'm not sure I quite yeah, understand. I think that if you, oh, sorry, I was just going to comment. Like, I think if you combined a number of these techniques, uh, mm -hmm. even the Pi four would give you real time performance. Yeah, I think you, I think you could do it on a four with. Um, you're not going to do it on a um, Arduino Nano for sure. But no, uh, no, not a, even a the Pi, TNC is going to run. Yeah. yeah. No, a Pi. I, I, you know, with it, with enough playing around with it, now, now you're into the trade off of developer time versus hardware cost. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a classic well, trade-off yeah. that engineers deal with all the time. <laughs> exactly. It, Lloyd, and, and, you know, now I'm kind of invested in the aura, and I'm probably going to go down that path. Oh, that's a way cooler solution. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Lloyd, can you go over that explanation one more time? I'm not sure I understood what you were saying. Yeah. There. Probably just okay. being dumb, but I didn't get it. No. So, so I, I'm just learning this myself. Um, I do have a background in... Uh, AI and machine learning, but I've been off doing aerospace stuff for a while, so I'm kind of getting back into it. So I may not get this completely right either. So fundamentally, imagine you've got this set of weights, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, that this, this is where you're feeding into the model. Um, there's a technique called quantitization. And so imagine to start with, and I don't know what, um, what accuracy you use, Bob, but, you know, typically on a desktop, or if you were doing Python, so I'm, I'm going to venture that you were using floating point, the float 32s, um, <clears throat> which, of course, if you've got a math code, is all well and good. Um, so you go down this quantization uh, path, and there's tools oh. to do this. And what you're, oh. what you're doing is you're going from a float 32 to a float 16 to a float 8. You could also drop into the integer domain. So you could go from a float 8 to an int 8, and now you've scaled your all of your numbers into an 8-bit value. And you can keep working this down. And I, I don't quite grok how this works yet, but there's a thing called you know, an int 1. You know, you could basically run these neural nets in you know, straight binary mode, right, where it's a 1-bit integer and, and get a result. But what happens is as you do that, the accuracy and precision of the model degrades, right? And now you're into this trade-off of how much compute time do I want to spend versus accuracy? So what, what they're, and the, the whole idea of this is on a, on a tiny, um, you know, something like, a, like an Arduino Nano, for instance, a very tiny low power processor, you run one of these quantization or quantitized models, I believe is how you say it, that's at, um, you know, one or two bits of precision per weight or, you know, that type of thing. And then you get a result. And the, the, the one I was studying is actually wake word. So like where the, um, this is, a, would be analyzing an audio signal. And um, essentially what you do is you may get a false positive, right? That, that these, for some reason, these things tend, at least seems to be they tend to degrade into giving you false positives rather than false negatives. And, and maybe you bias your model that way when you're training. 
But the idea is you run one of these quick and dirty things that's simple. It gives you a false positive. Now that you think you've got something, you spin up the heavyweight model and do it again and confirm. Excellent. Excellent. Love it. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And I, I'm just, I, I'm learning that dimension of it myself, because, you know, trying to get down into the nuts and bolts of the thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but unlike Bob, even though I do work in this area, I haven't had time to mess with it. <laughs> so, Bob, you can handle the practical side. I'll handle the theoretical. How's that? <laughs> Perfect, perfect. Um, it just reminded me, there's a great article uh, that uh, talks about the tricks or improvements, let's say, that NVIDIA has made in their GPU by moving away from kind of standard floating point numbers. Yes. Uh, so even inside the GPU, they're they're taking all these kind of um, effects into account so they can run faster. Isn't that, uh, there's a machine learning uh, thing that you can put on an uh, Arduino, and I think it does that. Um, there, there's several of them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Time um, is probably the most Mobius. commonly known. Yeah, there's one I think called Mobius. I could be getting that name wrong. And it was essentially a, um, a neural net processor that plugs into the USB port. Hmm. Yeah. You, you throw your. Very hard to buy. I'm trying to buy one. Huh? Oh, I was trying to buy those things as well. Like, like anything, you know, you can put onto the pie to make this all go faster. Yeah. So, so there is something like but, that. And yeah. essentially, um, okay. essentially what you do is you throw your model over there, you throw your data over there, you run the inference on this, you know, USB peripheral, and then you get your answer back. And, you know, obviously the you know, transfer and bandwidth is going to kill you. But, you know, hey, if you got a heavy model, yeah, you still might be ahead. <laughs> I was using the uh, smallest uh, models that the YOLO uh, guys uh, published. Yeah. Uh, the Coco said that uh, they call it the Nano. I think it's it's as I say about six megabytes. If you want to go into the quantized stuff, um, there's a book called Tiny ML. I just finished reading. The book itself is wonderful. All of the examples are out of date. Um, <laughs> like they they send you to the various and that you know they they're they're all pointing to these CoLab instances and so forth, which is how I got into it. But, but here's the thing. So there's another stack, and it's, um, it's essentially TensorFlow, right? So Keras is at the top. TensorFlow, which is another machine learning um, AI tool set, is, you know, does the prediction and inference, and it's different than the one YOLO is doing, and it's not nearly as easy to use. Um, but then you go to... From TensorFlow, you go to TensorFlow Lite, which is restricted in the in the layers that you can build. Then you go to TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. And at that level, you have tools to do the quantization and furthermore, switch the entire thing into the C and C++ domain. So you're no longer running in Python either. Um, and so, if, you know, people want, I can point you in that direction. It's a whole parallel tool set. It's not nearly as easy as um, what Bob did. Um, this is more of a professional, you know, go go, go build a real product type of, uh, well, YOLO, YOLO is too. I don't mean to ditch YOLO. <laughs> um, but this is something like, you know, you really need somebody who's kind of specialized in it. And that, that's kind of the, some of the training I'm trying to do at the moment because I, I don't quite grok it out of the box either. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a lot more work. So maybe maybe in a decade I'll come back and let you know how that went when it's all out of date again. <laughs> <laughs> Always a little bit behind. Yeah. Well, the the annoying thing for me is I was I was way ahead of the curve, you know, when I was in college, right? I was like you know thirty years ahead of the curve. And then I, so far ahead of the curve, it wasn't useful. And then I got sucked off doing other things. And now it's all, you know, all the stuff I was learning. Hey, this is practical and doable. And now I'm playing catch up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, uh, I was also kind of curious. You made a comment um, about the PID not being tuned um, on the drive system. I, just out of curiosity, how much time have you spent dorking about with getting the... <laughs> system tuned correctly on that oh i i think the the biggest 
I, I probably spent not more than a couple hours, really. Like, I needed something that was workable. And then by capturing telemetry about what was the PID actually doing, and then I could pass it into some way of visual graph, uh, I got something that was much more work. It was reasonably workable. Um, it could be way more optimal, but it works. It does what it needs to do. Uh, like, as you saw in that last video, it's able to climb hills. Mm -hmm. which I think is one of the harder problems, honestly, uh, when you start out kind of you're, you're applying some voltage to a motor and you're trying to control your speed. So, for example, I want to go close to the cone. I want to approach kind of slowly. I don't want to run the cone over. Oh, right. So, you know, I'm controlling the speed that way. And doing that on, on a gradient going uphill um, without some sort of uh, pin loop or PI loop is, is very challenging. I did enough tuning to make that work. I wouldn't so say it's, thing, it's optimal by any means. One thing my dad uh, showed me many, many, many years ago with DC motors was um, if you take the P, if you can uh, take the PWM frequency and turn it way, 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 way down. So you're getting like, hmm. you know, I don't know, maybe a hundred cycles per second or something like that. Uh, you get this where the motor vibrates more at low speed, right? Because it's like, you know, going all the way on. It has just enough time to start going before the PWM cuts back off again. Then you can go to a really low duty cycle and it will still like grind through it. So I, that's just a thing. I only ask about the PID thing because I keep waiting for somebody to write a book titled something like The Dark Art of PID Tuning. <laughs> <laughs> So, so question from my side, when you're going from your PID to your your motor, so you got P, excuse me, not from PID, from PWM to your motor, do you, are you putting a filter capacitor in there or are you just allowing the motor itself to do the filtering? Is that a question for me or James? Anybody. So I, I've always put a filter cap in, but what, James, what you just described sounds like you wouldn't want a filter cap. You want the, the inductance of the motor to do the, the low-pass filter for you. Yeah, that's that's interesting because, to be honest with you, I have never tried putting a filter cap on there. What I was told, and I've never see this is kind of dumb. I've never thought to question it, so I was kind of shocked when you just said that. Just now, Lloyd, <clears throat> what I've always been told is that if you if you do that, you'll end up burning out the drive transistors in the in the PWM system. But now no, you I'm, don't. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, well, why would that be? And you would get. You would get nice smooth motion for for the particular trick that yeah. I was describing there. You would definitely not want to because that's the whole point is and right. and it, and the downside of that trick is you definitely get really buzzy, nasty. You know, uh, uh -huh. like you can hear the motors like 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 kind of arcing and sparking sort of a thing. Right. But it, but, see, but but then your whole like your whole need for a pit system just goes away. You don't need that anymore. It just yeah. works fine. It. And and but but here's the thing. So it's interesting. You said you've never questioned it before. I was coming at it from exactly the other side of I've never <laughs> done it without filter caps, <laughs> and I've never questioned it. <laughs> that's see, that's what these meetings are for. Uh, that's great. We we could do a PhD paper on this. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, to cap or be... not to cap? That is the question. <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm about to to do a bunch of stuff with h bridges and really really cheap dc motors yeah. i'm playing around more and more with twisted string actuators which i'm really fascinated by and yeah. so I, I will have to try that what what kind of size of filter cap do you normally put like for a small motor yeah so i was using um <clears throat> it really depends you want to take and i wasn't doing it precise i was you know basically um getting a rough idea of the inductance of the motor and then I would, you know, choose a capacitor to give me a low pass filter, you know, somewhere okay. in the Hertz, you know, I mean, you, you know, basically I was doing a, um, an LC filter design, you know, where I'm approximating the, um, approximating the inductance of the motor. Cause of course, you know, the, the inductance of the motor is going all over the place. Right. Right. Um, right. Depending on speed and, you know, load and all the other things that motors I, I do. was about to ask how you figured out what the inductance of the motor was. I didn't. 
Okay. <laughs> I just I just took a ballpark and somewhat even by experimentation. Uh, right. So, but um, like, what what's the starting value? What uh, the starting um, value? I've used everything from 0.1 microfarad, and I think I've gone up as high as 100 microfarad. Okay. And and here's the catch: you do need to use if you're going to go up into the you know electrolytics, you need to use a non-polar electrolytic. Right. Otherwise, the back EMF will, you know, you'll put it one way, and even if you don't re, um, reverse the motor, you know, the back EMF will punch your punch a hole in your in your electrolytic yeah. for you and game over. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking about, I think the reason why I'd never thought of doing that is because almost all of my experience has been in stepper motors, and that would be a real bad idea. Yeah, you don't do that in stepper motors. <laughs> so, yeah, I was kind of applying that, sure. but. Hmm. Yeah, these are PWM, PWM driven brushed DC motors is the is the application. Which you know what I love. They're just they're old school and they're noisy and they're horrible, but they're massive torque and they're cheap as hell and they just do the job. And every five thousand hours you replace the brushes and get off the electric. <laughs> yeah, but you know the brush if if, if you've got a I've done a couple of projects where I've had the nice fancy brushless DC motor controllers. That have uh, the PID and the you know um, the various oh, forms of feedback again. in them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, you know, Bob, that just solves your problem. You don't need a PID. You just tell it go this fast, and it just does it. <laughs> <laughs> again, are you going to throw money at it or engineering time at it? <laughs> this is true. Always the trade-off. I was just going to ask if there's trade. any other questions about uh, you know, if there's any other questions about the presentation. Otherwise, I'll turn it back to. Uh, other other questions or topics yeah um just out of curiosity what you, you had a slide about where you were going next um and i was kind of curious like are you going to is there a place where we can follow what you're doing or is there a way that we can you know keep track of it because what you're doing is awesome i mean it's freaking cool yeah this is really yeah, i'm particularly cool. poor at publishing stuff like that uh, so now i don't have a great answer for that one um I well, do. Uh, there's, there's a group. Well, there's there's uh, various meetup uh, things that I do attend. So there's uh, a meetup group out of Vancouver. I'm I'm uh, living in Vancouver, BC. So we have a, a meetup that happens. It's it's on meetup.com. Uh, it usually happens every couple of weeks, and uh, I usually talk about you know kind of any progress there. But there's lots of people that are talking about interesting stuff. So that's a that's probably honestly the easiest way to keep track of this and and a good way to kind of interact. And, and of course, I'll be begging him to do more presentations in the future because this is way <laughs> cool. And I, I actually, Bob, I learned a lot from your presentation because, I, like I said, I've been doing it from the theoretical side and haven't gone through a practical application yet. So this this is way cool. <laughs> awesome! Oh, I'm glad that helped out. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as I say, it's a great topic. I could talk about this stuff for way longer than than we all have for today. So, but it is fun. So, Bob, what was that meetup that uh, you share your? Oh, uh, if you're looking on uh, meetup.com, it's uh, Vancouver Robotics Club. Uh, although that's what it started life as, and now it's a little bit of like, well, there's some people from the Pacific Northwest and some people across Canada, and and there's a fellow that that uh, is currently traveling in China that that jumps in. Well, it, it's hard to say it's Vancouver only. It's not Vancouver only. Everybody's welcome. Thank you. And great presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Thank you. I much appreciate that. Great. Then with that, I'm going to say thank you. But I, I will give the uh, the deck uh, to Lloyd and Steve because uh, I think they, they tend to post the uh, the slide yeah. decks for, for things after the fact. Yep, we'll get this posted. And so I'll do that. Um, okay. And the last thing I was going to do is, is, and again, the reason you probably want to get this is I did put a bunch of links in here. Uh, so actually, for the model that I have and all the training data and everything, it, it's available online. Uh, you can you can go get it from uh, my GitLab instance. Um, I have a YouTube channel where I recorded my three runs and some other random stuff uh, is on there as well. Um, the Ro I did mention Robo Columbus, uh, and, and it's a really cool event. Uh, it's definitely different than, than Robo Magellan, but but many of the concepts are the same. There's orange cones that you have to touch. Uh, you're you're playing outdoors. 
they do it on a particularly large kind of uh, relatively flat backyard. Uh, I love one of the members. It's, it's very cool. Their videos are great. They also have a bunch of interviews uh, with each of the robot uh, builders. And those are really interesting just to get some different perspectives or different ideas about uh, what you're doing there. And, and the DPRG uh, is, a, is, a, is a club of full of interesting uh, people. They do a Tuesday night uh, robot, robot builders kind of video, uh, virtual meeting. Um, and then uh, two other links that I, I particularly found kind of interesting and inspirational. Um, if you, you don't have to follow BattleBots at all, um, but that particular video, the guys who built uh, the, the the robot called Endgame um, put a lot of effort into thinking about how things could go right or go wrong with their battle bot. And I actually found it really interesting. Uh, I don't want to build battle bots necessarily, but I did find a lot of the things that they talked about uh, or or had to do for their robot um, kind of kind of interesting and useful. And then uh, the whole idea of, of this recording everything is kind of you know coming out of uh, what I my my one of my other interests, which is kind of the aerospace industry. What's going on with uh, rocketry and watching or listening to the uh, descent uh, of the Apollo Eleven uh, lander to the moon is really interesting in the sense of what's the computer doing? What are people doing to react to it? And I thought of it as the way of like how my robot reacting to the uh, data that it's getting. Anyways, hope you enjoy that. Thank you for the opportunity. And um, um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, Bob, can you paste the um, the links into the chat? Because they're images this way, and we'd have to retype them, and some of them are quite long. Yeah, I can do that. I mean, the PDF actually has clickable links, but I'll get them to you right now. So. Oh, okay. Give me I, a second, and I, I, I will uh, I'll do that. Be a PDF. Okay. Oh, I'm, it'll I'm be gonna, a PDF. But yeah, no yeah I'm going to stop the video real quick so it can start processing. Uh, let's see.